Hey, thanks for joining us on Next Up. On this edition, Alvin and I are doing something a little bit different. We ordinarily talk to local newsmakers about what's going on in the city, the county, or the state, but now we're going to meet a guy who about a quarter century ago was in the headlines when he, as a 20-something, was suing Pepsi. And in this improbable journey, his case has become a famous legal case that's taught at the Harvard Law School. It's uh, the reason you see, see so many disclaimers on ads <laughs> if you watch commercial television. And here at 9PBS, we hope you don't. But also, it's now a four-part Netflix documentary called Pepsi, Where's My Jet? Which garnered 30 million viewers in the first 10 days of its showing. And it's now seen in more than 140 countries. And so, John Leonard, welcome to KETC 9 PBS. It's so good to see you, especially since there's so many St. Louis connections in this show. Yeah, it's funny. It's in, in a roundabout way, St. Louis played a, a pretty important part. So thanks, and, thanks so much for having me. And the thumbnail sketch is when you were 20 years old, you saw a contest that Pepsi was running that if you turned in points, you could get great stuff. Yeah, and, and looking back on it now, it, uh, I, I kind of laugh at, at maybe how naive I was, and, and I, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing, but uh, yeah, 20, geez, 1995, Pepsi ran an a advertising campaign where they offered uh, a number of different prizes and, and different things, and uh, the promotion centered around this grand prize of, of winning a, a Harrier jet for 7 million points. <clears throat> And the first time that I saw it, it was introduced to me by a, a friend of mine that I was coaching Little League football with. And it sounded like this fanciful kind of idea. And then I actually saw the commercial. And this is through the lens and the eyes of a, of a 19 or 20-year-old. I go, holy mackerel, that might be doable. And, of course, how I look at it now today is, you know, a 48-year-old versus how I did then is, is, is different. But as a 20-year-old, I go, man, I think I can do that. You know, I, th I think you could make that happen. And I happened to have a friend who was, uh, you know, I would say I was a bit naive and he was maybe on the more crazy side, but I was able to talk him into to partnering with me in it. And, and we took a, a swing for the fences, if you will. Okay, so it was a, what, a, a dime a point. So you had to come up with $700,000 and did you do this math in your head automatically or did you start pursuing how and then that all came to fruition? Because uh, I, I think you just, the, my first thing wouldn't be to figure out how much money would I have to come up with to, to you know, like do this. So how did that, from that point about like you, you're thinking we could do this to, hey, we got to come up with $700,000. Well, so originally, um, and, and as the story progresses, we get to how we were able to buy the points for the, the $700,000-ish. Uh, but originally, I didn't know that that option existed. Oh, okay. And so the advertisement had, you know, Harrier Jet, 7 million points. And so I was like, I did some quick math in my head. I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, geez, a Harrier Jet must be worth $20, $30 million, something like that. And I'm like, 7 million Pepsi points can't be worth that much. So originally, I was like, huh, there, there might be an opportunity here. And so I started working on what it would take to actually go out and collect the points. And I estimated through different means, and this is 20-year-old, not probably the, the most mathematically inclined uh, person at this, this point, but I was able to, to come up with essentially a, a plan uh, with... Uh, that would take about $4.2 million to go out and buy all of the points. Mm -hmm. And so I pitched that to a group of investors and this particular friend of mine, Todd, who we ended up partnering with. And there was, huh, there might be something to it. But through a, a course of events, especially with the $4.2 million price tag, there were a, a, number of, a number of hurdles that I was, you know, asked to, to jump over, understandably. And um, I, I thought over time I was providing a lot of good answers to these two because I was, I was trying to get venture capital essentially for $4.2 million. But that didn't work out because after I had to prove the viability of what I would do with this aircraft to uh, turn it into a viable business to pay back the, the, the 
uh, investors as well as make it into a profitable venture. Um, the, the final question that I was asked was, so what happens if we invest in this and you go out and you get to like 695,000 Pepsi points and you can't buy anymore? Then what's the plan? Like, I didn't have an answer for that. And so essentially I got shot down and I made a, made a pitch, didn't work out, flew back home to Seattle. And the funny thing at that time is every time I went to talk to these uh, investors, I, f I flew through St. Louis at the time. That was back in the day when TWA was still flying and to get to Miami from Seattle, every flight went through, through uh, St. Louis on the old TWA oh, yeah. plane. But so there I was, made this big final grandiose pitch I thought, got shot down, back on a plane, Miami, St. Louis, Seattle with my tail between my legs. And uh, some matter of weeks later, I went into a, a store. At the time, I was going to a small uh, community college, washing windows uh, to pay, pay for things. And there was a, a point of purchase display. And I think it had like Cindy Crawford and the Spice Girls <laughs> and a bunch of cases of Pepsi. And there were the little uh, pamphlets for the contest. And I took one of the pamphlets and I was just kind of whimsically looking through it like, oh, this dream I had that didn't happen reading through it, flipping the pages, and I got to the end of the fine print. At the bottom of the fine print, it said, you could buy the points for 10 cents a piece. Quick math, I was like, that was $700,000. And it changed, it changed the whole pitch that I had. And so there again, hopped on a plane in Seattle, TWA through St. Louis to Miami, and I had a whole new pitch to make. Now, and it went from 4.2 to $700,000. Now, hang on a second. Did you contact the Pentagon to find out if indeed a civilian could actually own a Harrier jet? I did. There was, there was a, a couple of calls I made. One was to find out how much the jet would cost. Yeah. And at the time, uh, I grew up in Seattle, and Boeing had acquired McDonnell Douglas, who was making the, the Harriers. And so I was able, through calls with Boeing, to get um, what it would cost. And at the time, and probably not just the time, but you couldn't buy just one, right? And, <laughs> and so... The, that made the math kind of skewed a little bit. But could, could you, as a civilian, actually own one? So that was the call to the Pentagon. And um, it was a, you know, it seems like a long time ago in a lot of facets, and it was. And so back at the time, this is when you couldn't just get on and Google something. I remember going through encyclopedias, right? Encyclopedia Britannica, trying to find out information on the Harry and all those sorts of things. And I, I couldn't get to the answer as to whether or not you could own one. And where I ended up was is calling the Pentagon. And if there was any place where maybe in this whole thing I was a little disingenuous, <laughs> it was when I called the Pentagon. And I said, I'm a, you know, in a junior college back in Seattle, I'm working on a project. And I want to know if I can buy a Harrier jet. If a person could legally own a Harrier jet and through some series of, of calls, I'm sure folks were like, well, he seems like a nice kid. He's working on a school project. And they passed me off from person to person. And I ended up uh, talking to a person in the public relations office who was a spokesperson for the Pentagon at the time, uh, a gentleman named Ken Bacon. And uh, the answer that I got, and he kind of helped me through it, was that, yes, in fact, you could own a Harrier jet, but it couldn't have the armament part of it, so sure. it had to be right. essentially yeah. a demilitarized <laughs> mm -hmm. Harrier jet. Um, and uh, so that was a kind of a, a hurdle that I had to get over. Okay, so um, as you're going through this process, have you contacted Pepsi yet? And are they aware? And once they became aware, um, how short and terse was the letter telling you, <laughs> please leave us alone? <laughs> and so, you know, part of this, and I'm sure folks are at some level going, this kid's crazy. Yeah. And, and looking as a 48-year-old going back, I'm like, yeah, that kid was crazy. But in that mind at the time, the 20-year-old mind, I thought this was a competition, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to be the first, but I was thinking that other people were trying to do the same thing. Okay. So I wasn't broadcasting what I was trying to do because in my mind, I thought like it was the one person was gonna win the prize. And as fanciful as that might sound, that was my mindset at the time. And I was feeling like 
I was in a race against the clock to get as many points as I could before somebody else did. And uh, so there wasn't communication with the rest of the world. There wasn't communication with Pepsi or all those sorts of things. I was trying to get the points and get it submitted before somebody else did. But at some point, you sent them a $700,000 and change check. Yes. And how did they respond to that? So as part of any promotion, um, they have to allow you a means. In, I guess it's legally, so it's, it's not a, a game of skill or a game of chance or something like that. So there's ways in any of these competitions where you can accumulate a certain amount of essentially the proofs of purchase, but then you can also buy the points like I found out. So I had to buy a minimum amount of, of Pepsi to get the points and then I could make up the difference mm. by buying okay. points. And then per the rules of contents, contest, there was a, a shipping and handling charge that you had to include with it. And so the check that I ended up actually hand carrying uh, to uh, Young America, Minnesota, where the fulfillment house was, was for uh, $700,000, $708.50. And the- To eight, be exact. To be exact. And uh, the eight dollars and fifty cents was for the shipping and handling. It's crazy. Of a Harrier jet, yeah. yes. So, and so, how did Pepsi respond to young John Leonard of uh, the Seattle area? So, the the check and the the registration for the claim form and everything was taken to Young America, Minnesota, and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks went by, and. Uh, Letter came in the mail, and it was essentially Dear John Leonard. Said, uh, thanks for your efforts, um, but the offer was a joke, and here's uh, two free cases of Pepsi for your time. <laughs> 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 All right, now, did, were you just like, I can't let it die here? Why did you move on after that? Well, and it's funny, people ask, well, what did you expect? And I don't know what I expected. We were not that sophisticated. <laughs> and if I could do it all over again, there would be different things I would do. Heck, if I could do it all over again now through the 48-year-old mind, I might not even have done it, right? Um, but at the time, we just, we weren't thinking that far ahead. And so they sent the letter, the Dear John letter. I sent a letter back that said, no, I mean, this is what you guys said. This is what I did. Like, Two cases of free Pepsi's not like it was. It was. It's not a Harrier jet. And it, it was. It was. I think it was a bit too dismissive, right? And so he sent a letter back and said, "This is what the officer said, and this is what I expect." And again, radio silence for for quite some time. And at this time, I'm still living at my my parents' house just outside of Seattle. And I come home one day from work, and my mom says, "Hey." A reporter from the Wall Street Journal called looking for you. I'm like, geez, why, why would a reporter from the Wall Street Journal be calling me? How does anybody know about this? And uh, so I called the number back, and the individual says, hey, I'm a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, and I came across a, a, a case filing today in the Southern District in New York where Pepsi sued you. Um, and I'm like, what? How did Pepsi sue me? And what Pepsi had done is they had, they had filed a preemptive lawsuit against me uh, in this case. And the way the story has been told, and, and again, I, I get all these things, it's, it's interesting to see, but Pepsi, it, it kind of tried to paint this picture of this young, uh, opportunistic guy that lawyered up and did all these things and sued Pepsi. And the reality was that Pepsi sued me first, and that's how it became a public story. And I don't begrudge them for it, right? It was the right legal maneuver to do. But um, from the two cases of Pepsi for my troubles, and then we sent a letter back. I sent a letter back and said, well, no, I want the jet. The response to that was a suit, a federal lawsuit filed against me in the Southern District of New York. And, you know, wh what year was this? If this began in 95, what, now what year are we at now? So this is, um, this is, 
late 95 or early 96. Okay, so we're yeah. still within kind of the first year of the entire process. Yep. Okay. I, I remember this, and uh, you were quite the controversial kid back in the day. You know, I was doing talk radio here in St. Louis, and you would become a topic. Honestly, I don't remember if I was for you or against you, but you had a lot of detractors in this country. Yeah, and it was, I, I think, um, I think I was in, in, in public opinion, I was maybe a little ahead, maybe a little, uh -huh. maybe a little behind, depending on, on where you're at. And because after all, they had a contest. And they said seven million points, you get the Harrier jet, and there was no disclaimer. Yeah. Not not in this country anyway. You found out later that they did always have a disclaimer in Canada. Yeah, and understand, and I it, it so many learning experiences in this, but um, again, we weren't prepared. I wasn't prepared. I didn't know what would come next, right? And so when Pepsi filed the lawsuit against me, they also kicked into gear their PR machine and they painted the story about this guy who had a bunch of rich friends, was trying to take advantage of the system, hired a bunch of lawyers and business advisors and you know was, was trying to take advantage of Pepsi and un understand the story that was trying to be told. Um, as we were making this uh, film and the people that were working on the documentary, they were able to talk to all of the executives and a lot of people that were involved with this. And what Pepsi had become to understand, what they thought was, and uh, what they thought was is that there was a, a group of wealthy individuals that found essentially a shill uh -huh, right, to right. be the front guy yeah. to try to take advantage of this system. And that was what, uh, at least to my understanding, is what they truly believed. And so that was their kind of starting point. And if you take it from what they believed it was, their responses were, I think, very reasonable, right? They're like, huh, we got some group of wealthy people. Somebody saw an ad. They're going to take advantage of this. And they found this kid that was going to be their front person for it. And that was not the case. It was the furthest thing from the truth that there could be. But if you think about it, in, in their eyes, it, it was a reasonable conclusion. Like, it, in, in whose mind could a 20-year-old uh, find somebody with the wherewithal to come up with almost a million dollars to throw in with them and go up against one of the biggest corporations in the world? And as I, as I later found out, there were a, lo a lot of people like me that were trying for it. And this was in the early days of the internet. But after it became public, people contacted me and said, hey, I have this website up and I've been trying to get people to donate all their points to me so I could claim the jet. I had a number of people reach out to me and go, oh, I was trying to do that too. And I think what Pepsi probably thought is there'd be a lot of kids like me that dreamt about it. And I was 20 at the time, so kid or whatever, young, young, young person to dream about it. And it did get me to dream about it. And what I don't think they could have ever thought was that a 20-year-old dreamer like me would have had access to a, a I say this in, in the most endearing terms, a crazy friend like Todd Hoffman that would actually go on this ride with him. He, he's the guy who wrote the $700,000 check. Yep. But also, you came in contact with the pride of Parkway Central, Michael Avenatti, who yeah. at one point was working with you. And... Uh, your other partners like Hoffman and your previous lawyer, in, in this documentary on Netflix, they, they have nothing good to say, I'll say that, about uh, Michael Avenatti. Yeah, it's, it's it, that, it, interesting. There's a bunch of these little St. Louis, St. Louis connections and he, he was one of them. And so at the time, I'm 20. Michael was 24, 25. Um, again, we didn't know what we were doing. We had an attorney that had essentially drafted this partnership agreement between Todd and I. It wasn't an attorney that was doing litigation or anything, but when Todd and I got in this venture um, and he wrote a check for 700K, we developed, we had a, we had a, a limited partnership essentially and the attorney had, had drafted that. And that was what his role was at the time. But then when we got sued, we went back to the attorney and said, well, what do we do here? And none of us knew what to do. And it got a bunch of media attention. It's like, what do I say? I don't know, just go out and be who you are and, and talk. It's like, perfect. I took calls and, and whatnot. But as things started to go on, it became apparent that I needed some help with telling the story. And 
our attorney knew somebody that kind of did some PR in, in San Francisco, a woman named Muffy Meyer, who's, who's since passed away, and they had some, some relationship. And so he called Muffy, who was in the PR business. And again, this is like, and I use this analogy, it's like the bad news bears. We're all kind of like, this isn't a pro fo type of operation. And she's like, yeah, I'm not really interested in this, but I know this guy who's young, he's hungry, he's smart, he's ambitious. Maybe he would be willing to help you out. And that was Michael Avenatti. And at the time, he was kind of in the PR business, but he was in the political opposition research business as well. And I think he was probably hungry enough. Um, his billable hours weren't huge, and he was willing to say, hey, I'll try to help, help, help this kid out. And so I think I was 20. I think he was 24. He wasn't a lawyer at the time. He wasn't in law school at the time. He was somebody that was doing PR and in research. Hmm. And, um, yeah. Okay, so they sue, Pepsi sues you. Mm -hmm. So now we're in the legal world litigation. Uh, would you have sued them? And then how did the case end up in a courtroom where a decision was made? So Pepsi sued me, and then a short time later, um, I guess the way it works, and the way it worked then is you get sued, then you sue them, right? And so they filed a suit against me, I filed a suit against them, and my friend Todd lived in Miami, the attorney that drew up the partnership agreement was in Miami, and so they sued me in New York, I sued them in Florida. And so there was a, two different lawsuits going through some legal process. Um, both of the suits were, well actually, we challenged their lawsuit of me in New York for lack of venue, which uh, it was determined by the judge that they didn't have, uh, excuse me, lack of jurisdiction. I hadn't done anything in New York. I didn't have business entities or any sort of thing in New York. So the case against me was dismissed uh, in New York. And the case that we'd filed, I'd filed against Pepsi in Miami was transferred then to New York. Mm -hmm. And then it was years of briefings and filings and all that sort of stuff. And, and at one point they give you a real generous offer to settle and there you are 2021 20, yeah. and everybody else in your partnership says take it take it and you john leonard decide not to take that well well into six figure settlement yeah so probably not the i probably not the best decision of my life <laughs> looking back on it we did laugh i'm sorry and uh i mean can we say how much it was for so we had a a settlement conference in New York and this was after a couple of you know depositions and different things and um, Todd and I were partners in this but he was clear from the beginning and, and I think he looked at this whole venture we were we were close friends we were at different stages of life uh, but I, I we, had, we had a nice friendship it was a, it was really a, it is and remains a neat friendship I think this was more for him about um, trying to teach some life lessons to a young person that he thought maybe had had some uh, ambition or future or talent or whatever. But from the get-go, he was very comfortable with this, hey, I'm the investor in this, this is your idea, but it's your idea. And the decisions that are consequential are ones that, that will lie with you because this will affect you much more than it will me. At the same time, as you saw with when we were trying to work through things with Michael Avenatti, he was, he was trying to ensure that I didn't do damage to myself or the case or whatnot. But we end up in New York and we have a settlement conference and they make an offer of $750,000 uh, to, to settle this. And they insinuated, they said, you know, and, and these were uh, conversations that some I was directly part of and others that I wasn't, but I was in the room when an offer for $750,000 was made. And I was asked to go out of the room and consider it with Todd. And we're out considering it. My attorney comes out and says, well, we could probably get it up to a million dollars. And I thought about it. And though, Charlie, you said it was generous, and, and I don't disagree with you, in my 20-year-old mind, I'm thinking, okay, I did my research. I called Boeing. I called the Pentagon. I would pegged the value of the jet on the low end at $23 million. And in that 20, 21 year old mind, I'm like, geez, I'm getting ripped not, off. That's not a good deal. <laughs> I, want the, I want the jet, you know? And 
Todd looked at me and said, are you sure you want the jet? And I'm like, I want the jet. The attorney was like, it's not a good idea, young man. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I want the jet. And, and there we went. And, and this story is now running on Netflix in 140 plus countries. Uh, in the first, it came out a month ago or, or, yeah. or so, getting great reviews. It's 100% ratings on Rotten Tomatoes. And uh, in the first 10 days alone, there were uh, 30 million households watching. Yeah, interesting. And it, it, it's, it, it's funny, right? It's, I look back on it and I laugh at uh, how naive I, I was, you know, probably what a knucklehead I was. And uh, when we got into it, I didn't want actually to tell the story. I it kind of died on the vine. It'd been in my past, but uh, with COVID, of course, I mean, I, a couple of different interests. But there was a drive and a need for content on these different streaming platforms. So people started pitching it to me and pitching it to me. And I'm like, I don't, I just, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. But we had a, a gentleman who ended up making the documentary. He seemed really sincere, and he pitched it in a way that I said, you know what, maybe I'll think about it. But I said, I'll only do it if, if it's going to be fun and that I don't come across as a complete idiot. <laughs> I said, if we can do it in that fashion, maybe we can do it. And, and I had a ton of fun doing it. Whether or not I came across well or not, that's, that's in the eyes of the viewer, viewer, not me. But it was a lot of fun. And we learned a lot. We learned about everything that was on the other side. I think people are going to enjoy yeah. it. Well, in our last few seconds. Worth it? Uh, I probably wouldn't have said no to the 750, um, but the journey was a blast. And had I said no to the 750, the journey wouldn't have happened. All right. So. Thank you so much, man. Interesting story. You can check it out on Netflix. Yes. You can check us out next week right here on Donnie Brook and Next Up. Thank you. Donnie Brook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS.